Hi. If I could, I would like to verbally, it's easier than typing on my phone. Um, how do you move down the tree from leaves to roots? Because I feel like it's, I feel like the leaves, the things that are most visible, um, when you're at the top, like I feel like some of those actions are easier to take, but to get to the root of it, to really change the internalized white supremacy, my 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 mindset and my thoughts. Like I noticed one of the very first things when it was talking about the roots or the seven uh, seven assumptions, it was talking about mm -hmm. people are good, and I don't have that assumption. Um, <laughs> I don't assume that people are good, and I want to. I, I want to think like that, but I know I know I don't. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you go from, how do you flip that mindset? How do you work to get to the root belief and change it? Yeah, um, practice, right? Um, and I think when I think about those seven core assumptions and those were put together by two ladies named Carolyn and Kay, uh, two white ladies who have been doing restorative justice work for a while um, from the perspectives of like social work and education and the criminal legal system. Um, and they've taken those seven core assumptions um, and I can pull up the document and drop it in the chat. Uh, and they've taken those things, right? Um, and like, these are the assumptions that we work off of. And it's an invitation for people to engage in this. Like, I'm not ever going to say like, this is the only way that you have to think about these things. It's just really helpful uh, to work from that perspective. Um, and that's not a concrete answer to your question. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's the practice and that invitation, right? I think we're limited by our imaginations of what things can be. Um, and it's just an invitation to do things um, a little bit um, more every day. And I think start with the relationships that you have, right? Um, start with the people who are easiest <laughs> and then work from there. Um, someone asked if this will be available for rewatch. Yes, it will be. Um, yeah, I can go back to the tree slide for folks. How many slides back is this? There we go. I just want to say I appreciate the question in the beginning about switching from diversity and inclusion to the restorative justice piece, because as we talked about in our group, at least one, one of my perspectives is that it acknowledges reality and holds for accountability, um, because what's the saying, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And so saying diversity and inclusion to me, it's like, oh, would you like to come to my house and visit? We'll treat you nice, as opposed to restorative justice, acknowledging things and choosing from this point on, what are we gonna to do to correct for the wrongs that have been done? It's not ignoring it um, and being intentional to address it. And so I just really appreciated that. It makes a big difference to me with my language. Hmm. Hi, can I add something very quickly? Yeah. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is Rubina and I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, material uh, for a couple of different reasons, one for work and also for personal. Um, uh, I'm an activist, social activist on, on different things. And I look at racial injustice and um, right now, uh, ethnic uh, cleansing and, and genocide and really, really weird, weird things that are happening globally. And so I can definitely take from some of these uh, from your model, but some of the stuff where I'm seeing you know, the, those, those folks that have written that humans are good and I understand why there's a trigger in there or there's something questionable in there with, with people from, you know, BIPOC um, because some of the things that these folks have experienced are, you know, when you're experiencing apartheid or genocide, these, these, those rules don't apply. Um, and so uh, I, I don't believe, I believe that people are inherently good when they're born. I think they're learning hate and it's a very strong thing that does need to be acknowledged, does need to be addressed, does need to be worked with in, in America, I'm seeing it. Um, in, the, in, you know, uh, in the last few years, we're, we're seeing uh, this hatred movement growing um, just ridiculously so. Um, and uh, it's also happening in other parts of the world too, or it has happened in other parts of the world for a long time. And it's also happening here too, uh, more recently and very, very visibly and with the internet instantaneously. So 
I, I do um, um, debate where they're saying that people are good. That's a nice assumption. That's a nice bias. But I think that is also an assumption and a bias. And until I see some statistical facts and I know that I can get people out of that, I don't think I can get certain politicians out of that. And I think we can all think of certain people that we just believe are doing very hateful things in the world. And I want that to be acknowledged also, um, because if it's not acknowledged or, or addressed, it's invisible um, and, and you get stuck in trying to move the conversation forward because you can't. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think one of the things, um, oh, um, Stephen, were you trying to share something? Did you want to share something? Yes, I was, uh, David. Uh, I just yeah. want to say, this is Stephen Underwood from Washington, D.C. I just want to say thank you for uh, putting this on. And I just wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, what Ms. Uh, Rubana, I, I, I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. I do apologize. Rubina, uh, thank you. Thank you very Rubina, much. Rubina, right. Rubina. Uh, you know, you, you may mention in uh, me and Ashley uh, and uh, Ross uh, Thomas, we talked about this in the uh, you know, this seven minute discussion, you know, in order to deal with this tree, you know, you and you uh, acknowledge it about fruit. And one thing about fruit, and I take this from my, uh, you know, learning of uh, DNI and dealing with belonging and things of that nature. I deal, I deal with it from a spiritual aspect. And one of the things that I learned from one of my friends that deals with forestry and deal with trees, he said, in order for anything to grow, and like when he's dealing with a part of the forest that is, uh, that is totally uh, decimated and can't grow. He said, the forestry people will purposely set a fire to the forest at one end and set a fire at the other end. Why? Because there are certain nutrients and there's certain proteins or there's certain oxidation that is trapped in the earth to where nothing can grow. And I believe that with this tree in both positive and, and uh, negative approach that there has been a, uh, a growing or systemic uh, uh, just uh, plaguing of this growth of a continuation of white systemic uh, uh, supremacy. And so when you're not willing to deal with how the tree has grown, you must first deal with the pruning and the purging process and what I was uh, speaking to Ross and uh, Ashley about, you have to deal with the pruning process because if you don't, you're going to have both good fruit growing with bad fruit and then the bad fruit contaminate the good fruit. And I believe this is what uh, Rubina is referring to is that we have had this uh, homogenation or this uh, cross integration of good fruit and bad fruit going together. But nobody, you know, whether it be you, David, or whether it be Rubina, or any of us uh, trying to deal with this matter, many of us are not wanting to deal with, hey, we have bad fruit that is on this tree. And whenever you, you know, uh, one thing I love that uh, Malcolm X uh, said in his book about the measure of a man, and, you know, please forgive me for those that are, you know, on uh, proper gentrification, you know, and things of that nature. But he says about the, the thing about the uh, measure of a man. It's not where a man or woman stands during times of convenience and comfort. The challenge really comes. Where do we all stand in the time of controversy and challenge? And this is where we're at at the crossroads, not only in America, but around the globe. Because what, what has happened to America today is that all this stuff, uh, David, and what you presented, America now has been seen for what it really is and what it has been and what it is going into the future of still being. And so if we're not willing to deal, you know, before we even get to the fruit, we have to deal with, we have to deal with the layers of the tree and that comes with pruning and purging. And so uh, I agree with Rubina and uh, many others uh, that, uh, you know, the, the uh, first young lady that came forward before Rubina. But uh, I just would like to know your uh, your thoughts on that, David, about, you know, dealing with uh, dealing with this and, and dealing with the tree 
because again, if we don't, you know, we're still going to have, and, and, and you, you, you know, you posted the, and said something about the Catholic church about a paper bull, but we, you know, and I was saying with ask, we have to deal in order to deal with this tree. We have to deal. And what Rabina is talking about, we have to deal with the uh, basic social economics. And you just stated in your presentation, we have people over there right now that are stripping Africa of its resources. But yet you have the people that they're taking the resources from that are living on a dollar a day or less. And, you know, and uh, I would like to know, you know, uh, your thoughts on, you know, making the shift from DNI and what you were talking about restorative justice in order to deal with restorative justice. How can we properly deal with that when you have had people that have just been systemically, socially, economically, spiritually, mentally, physically, that have not even been in the playing field of DNI and belonging, and then getting to restorative justice. And like Rubina said, they don't even know what they look like. All they have dealt with from the time of, uh, of coming from their mother's womb, they have dealt with just nothing but pain and hurt. And so I would like to hear your thoughts on that. But thank you for allowing me to speak. Yes, absolutely. Um, there, there's a lot in both of yours. And I think one of the things uh, for me, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to touch on. One, when I talk about accountability, uh, one of those things is the harm is acknowledged, right? Um, one of the things that, uh, <laughs> that annoyed me um, after the Chauvin verdict came down, people on across social media were like, this is not justice, this is accountability. And I was like, no, this is punishment, right? Accountability means that you're taking responsibility for the harm that you caused, you're gonna change your behavior and do what you can to repair. And like, when I'm talking about restorative justice, right? That's restoration to wholeness, not restoration to what was when that incident happened, right? And wholeness to the extent possible, right? George Floyd's and coming back, that's not possible. Um, but what does it mean for Derek Chauvin to acknowledge the harm that he's caused um, and, and make changes in his life and prevent this kind of harm from happening again in the future within the scope of like what he as a person who is formerly a police officer can do, right? What does it look like for him to work with other police officers um, to start to shift those ways? And I don't imagine that's ever going to happen. We live in a world that disincentivizes him from showing any remorse um, and continuing to deny and de defend himself. Um, and that's the way that our world is set up and incentivized. Um, I also think about, you know, uh, if y'all are familiar with uh, Chanel Miller, um, who was a young woman uh, from the Bay Area, she was raped by a man named Brock Turner. Um, and, you know, Brock, and this was a very widely publicized case. And what we think about Brock Turner, like he had no incentive to show remorse. Like the criminal legal system asks us to deny, 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 innocent until proven guilty, right? So if you can get away with it, um, that's, that's what your incentive is. And so when people have that incentive structure, it's hard for them to tap into that good, wise, powerful self, right? How can they... Um, it comes about protecting themselves. But when I think about, you know, these feelings and needs, right? When you cause harm, you still need these things, even if you're unaware of it, right? The logical conclusion to like, these people are bad, let's get rid of them is like, if someone does something harmful, you should kill them, right? Like that's good. like either lock them up forever or kill them. That's the logical conclusion, right? If you get stuck, you get stuck in your polars then at that point. And it's, it's, yeah, you end up being the oppressed, become the oppressor. Right. And so to someone like these politicians that we're talking about, or like these systemic entities, right, that are um, still perpetuating genocide, um, still taking resources from indigenous people um, and sovereign places, right? That's the incentive structure of the world. Um, and what is it that we can do? I'm not saying that restorative justice is nonviolent. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> um, I didn't, uh, yeah. Like, I think before you enter a restorative justice process, right, the harm has to stop. 
Um, and if the harm hasn't stopped and you're not, and somebody uh, who has caused harm isn't willing to take responsibility, like there's no, res there's no restoration to be had. Um, so I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet cure all thing, but if we're gonna engage in this work with folks, uh, we have to invite them in, assuming that there is something um, good, wise and powerful. Otherwise, like why would they come to the table, right? And then, and then how much can you accomplish? So y yes, no, I, I really resonate with what you've said and, um, and I, I, I thank you for that. Um, it's, it's help giving me frame and um, um, the language, you know? It feels like a very new space um, that's been very silent for a long time because like we're groomed to be, you know, othered and silent and quiet and against the norm and you just want to fit in and assimilate and now we're trying to say, no, wait, that fitting in norm assimilation is kind of wrong because it forgot to include me. So now you guys have to include me. So now what does that look like? And it feels like we're doing it for the first time, which is fabulous, which is great. And I love this. And I love this presentation and what you've done. Um, um, and um, you're, you're giving me some tools to move forward in, in, in what I'm working on. And so I thank you. I thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to shout out, uh, Precious, just one, I'll, I'll get you in one second. I want to shout out something that got said in the chat earlier, like, I'm a good person is a really good gaslighting technique. And I think the conversation just shifts to like, yes, intent versus impact, right? This is what your intention was, um, but these are the needs that were caused <laughs> by your good intention. And like, I can acknowledge that you didn't mean to make me feel bad or you didn't mean to make me afraid um, and you know isolated, but you did. And I'm not saying that you are a terrible, whatever label that you wanna throw on that person, right? I'm saying like, this is a harm you caused. Um, I am someone who has lied. I'm someone who has stolen. I am someone who has done a lot of harm in my life, right? And those things don't define me, right? I'm someone who has misgendered people. I am someone who has made sexist jokes, right? I'm someone who has done things that have caused harm. Um, and those things don't define me, right? Those things are, and and I think like there's there's a gray area where you like you are what you repeatedly do. I, I still don't think that's true. Like there is, um, you know, you talked about Rubina, like there's someone who comes, someone comes into the world um, and they're shaped by their environments, but there is some restoration to wholeness that's still accomplished. Whether or not they're willing to put in the work, whether or not you're willing to put in the work um, and whether or not it's safe for you to put in the work, that's another question. <laughs> but uh, there, there is a way for us to um, move forward. Um, but it, for me, there has to be otherwise like kill all the mofos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it gets into a very dark space and you never really break out. You never really do accomplish what you want to accomplish. And so, yeah. Um, and if anybody wants to know anything about the work I'm doing, it, it, it's the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And um, I am neither Palestinian nor Israeli. And so I'm just trying to come as um, outsider, but also an insider because I, my faith background and, and things like that. And then just my just trying to help from from my space. Um, so you're, uh, if anybody wants to help, um, uh, let me know. I would love it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rubina. Uh, Precious, you were going to say something. I, I was just going to say I, I appreciate your comment. When you did this during the um, the webinar, you asked us uh, about how we felt when we had experienced harm and all of that. I mean, and the answers were coming in so fast you could barely read them. Then when you said, what about the harm we have caused? Took a pause, but then we started kind of coming in with that too. And I just say that's to your point that we have all at some point, we, we messed up, we've caused harm. And if our conclusion is um, you're, you're deemed one or the other, good or bad, and then all the bad would just be killed or locked away forever. I mean, who would we have? And so I appreciate this whole component of the restorative piece because um, there was hope for us like hopefully we're still not in those spaces where we're continually um, doing harm. And when you engage us in that, like what were the needs we had? What were the, that could have reached us? Because I think sometimes the best teachers and parents are those who remember when they were bad too, or remember how they felt when they were at certain ages and stages and things they did. 
So they have a, a way of interacting with others when they are caught up in those same spaces. Because I, I don't know, and I, I'm not going to go deep, but I, I really appreciated that because of how it turns it, the light back to us. And um, if we choose to see people from the same lens we want others to see us, that's a piece that has um, empathy written all over it. And it, it, it's just, it's necessary and it's beneficial, but I appreciate it. And that has nothing to do with negating negative and harmful behaviors, but being able to separate that sometimes from those who commit them, you can, you can see how to fight in a different way. If we only fight the person, you have not addressed the issue that fueled them. And when we can see beyond that, that's just me, some of my core thoughts. Um, so I appreciate how you did that and I received it. I think Precious makes a good point, you know, and it gets back to the fruit because if we, if we never deal with our own tree, then we start, you know, then we start producing other fruit after our own kind. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I think that she made a, a good, uh, a good illustration of connecting not only what you presented, but connecting not only with herself, but how you made it come, you made it come back full circle for all of us in this uh, in this presentation that you so you know eloquently done and presented to us, is that you know, uh, and, and for me, what I got about when you showed the tree, it spoke to me, Stephen. What kind of tree are you? You know, there's all types of trees out there. You know, you have fern, you have oak, you have you know redwood. But what type of tree do I want to be? You know, and, uh, you know, for me, I, I think of what you presented here out of all the trees in the world. I like when I was over there and, and was able to live and uh, service over there in the Middle East. One of the most uh, expansive trees is the fig tree. It's the, it's the most broadest and it's the most expansive trees of, out of all the trees, but it, it provides. Oh, no. <laughs> I wanted to hear the end of that. Yeah, but this is a fig tree. <laughs> um, man, that was going somewhere great. <laughs> um, hopefully we get him back in just a second. Um, I'm going to respond to Marky. Um, what are my thoughts about DNI work using an RJ approach? I think restorative justice is a foundation for a lot of this work. And like, I think in a lot of ways, if you're doing this work in a good way, the conversations for diversity and inclusion aren't needed and necessary, but I think you can definitely use restorative practices like talking circles and checking in like to, to build relationships and have these conversations in a way that is less abrasive, uh, more welcoming, um, really because like as much as it, I have this assumption that like people who cause harm and when we're thinking about people in organizations who are uh, perpetuating harm, like, if, if my assumption is that they are good, wise, and powerful at their core, right, like, how can I best call them in to being accountable? Um, something that we definitely don't have time to get into right now is, like, you, I don't think that you can actually hold somebody else accountable, right, like, accountability has to be something that's internal, um, and without the context of a relationship, um, it's really hard to do that, and so restorative practices can be a really good way to um, invite people into that relationship. It's that both proactive, right? Relationship building um, and responsive repair of harm. Steven, you're back. Fig tree, lay it on us. No, I, I was just saying that, you know, it just spoke to me about the fig tree, you know, of, of what type of tree, do, you know, do I want to be and what, I, what it is that I want to produce moving forward, you know, uh, and one of the things that you dealt with was uh, the harm that you, you know, as Precious talked about, and I don't mind talking about this because I went through my own extensive, you know, of dealing with my own restorative uh, justice in my own life. You know, uh, I find I'm 51 years old now, and uh, I finally didn't speak to my father about things that I had dealt with and been through, you know, from different places that we live. And uh, he didn't know him and my mom didn't know. And, and uh, my mom is now dead and gone on. But uh, I spoke to him. I think this has now been two or three years ago. Uh, I spoke to him about being sexually abused, you know, uh, being a military, you know, a military brat and a military child. And uh, then when we transitioned and transferred to a little small coal mining town in Kentucky, 
you know, these kids that were same age as me, you know, they had access to, you know, alcohol, drugs. And then it was like, you know, oh, you know, I can use this stuff and, you know, and escape my problem. But then what I tried to escape a problem that I had been through created a whole other different genre of other problems. Well, I then became, you know, a being abused, as they said, you know, and as somebody said in the chat, hurt people hurt people. And that's what I was doing in my, from my junior high school days to I graduated uh, high school. And then when I got in the military, it happened again, you know, and different things of that nature. And so this whole thing of restorative justice is speaking volumes to me personally because of, of so many injustices I've incurred in my young life, my middle, you know, my teen and teenage year life, and even in my young adult life. And so I would like to ask you, and maybe you can answer this, or or uh, maybe not, or maybe we can, you know, talk about this uh, in a private, uh, you know, session together. But, uh, you know, in a situation like that, where you have someone that has uh, dealt with this type of uh, systemic injustices in their life. How do you engage people? And I'm pretty sure that you have had people in your, you know, in your presentation, whether online or in person, how do you engage them to, uh, in moving forward to, uh, to be a, uh, to be a vehicle of change of restorative justice compared to just, you know, because it would be easy for anybody like myself or anybody else to just sit back and just like, you know, oh, it doesn't involve me, you know, and because it doesn't involve me, I just wash my hands of it. But how would you say of people that are, you know, that are dealing with serious injustices in their life of taking this, what you presented and becoming this tree of restorative justice and making true impactful change right in their, you know, right in their garden of where they find themselves planning. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really big question. Um, something that I think about when we look at these feelings and needs, specifically the needs, right? It's not always the case that the person who's caused harm can uh, repair the harm, right? Um, and the person who has been harmed, when we're talking about like correction and guidance, and all that, right? It's not necessarily their responsibility to do that. Like, what is the community supporting? Like, who are the trees that are around you? What are the other plants that are around you? Like, how can you get your needs met uh, through that kind of support? Um, that was a huge question. And I don't wanna go past like the, uh, the bottom of the hour, but I would just like simply say like, what are the community supports? But that that's a much bigger question. Um, anybody else uh, in the, in the last couple moments. Definitely want to invite people. If you're an educator, um, definitely have these spaces. Um, and like, this is built with the intention of people in K to 12 or higher ed and educator is a loosely held term. So uh, feel free uh, to participate if that's your lane. Uh, but also next week we are going deeper with Victoria and in the future we'll be building out um, spaces for people who are doing DEI work broadly to engage in similar learning than to that intensive that we have for educators. So stay tuned. Um, two minutes. Any last minute questions? Or is just this just the moment where people are hanging on to the call to grab any last morsel? All right. Well, I'm going to give everyone permission to say normal, normal, no more morsels. We're going to, we're going to cut it off.